Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And I'm an emeritus professor of clinical dentistry at UCLA and I have a private practice in West Los Angeles. Today we're going to tackle the large class 2 amalgam restoration. We're going to start by assembling the Toffelmeyer matrix retainer. This was invented many years ago by a Navy dentist by the name of Joe Toffelmeyer. We're really grateful for his invention. It's been really helpful. Let's talk about the carving in four steps. The first step is all about condensation. So now we have the matrix in place, and you can see that there's a wedge that's holding the matrix against the tooth. And remember that for any proximal restoration, we need to accomplish three things. Seal, contours, and contact. And in this particular case, we may have contact, we may have contours, but we don't have good seal. So how are we going to fix that? Well, it's really simple. Just loosen the Toffelmeyer, the outer nut, and rotate it out of the way, and then insert a wedge on the facial side of the interproximal space. And now you can see we have terrific seal. I'm using uh, an amalgam called Contour it's an admixed amalgam, high copper. It's been around for a long time. I'm condensing it with a lot of force. Of course, I'm speeding this up so we can get to the more fun stuff at the end. But I think condensation is really probably the most critical step in any amalgam. Amalgam should be wet like this. If your amalgam is very dry, uh, that has been formulated usually because dentists like it dry, but Amalgam likes to be in a mercury-rich environment in order to have the ultimate strength. Now you can see we're moved on to a larger condenser and we're uh, confirming the outer layer of condensation by pressing very hard. If you were to hear this, it was squeaking a lot of the time. And that kind of squeaking sound is indicative of adequate condensation. We overfill the amalgam, of course, so that we are never under contoured. And once again, the egg ball burnisher here being used to confirm the condensation. At this point, we're going to pick up a sharp explorer. We're going to clean away the excess. And that includes the area between the band and the proximal. In other words, the occlusal embrasure area. What might be kind of surprising at this point is we are going to remove the matrix assembly. First by removing the Toffelmeyer, then by removing the band, and finally the last thing we remove is the wedge. We don't remove the wedge before we remove the band. We want to keep the teeth slightly separated. Let's focus on proximal contours. And for this, we're going to utilize the IPC carver, interproximal carver. This is a carver that's been around in dentistry for probably about 45, 50 years. Um, I know that some of the developers uh, in this instrument were Dr. Jim Summit from University of Texas, San Antonio, Lloyd Baum that was at Loma Linda, and both those gentlemen are my mentors and have written textbooks on inoperative dentistry. And this is such a beautiful instrument. It's very different than the Hollenbeck. Now we're going to utilize the cleoid discoid carver, this time the cleoid end, to start the process of finding our margins. And that is the third step in the amalgam carving. I can't help myself, I just do a little bit of carving uh, the anatomy at this point, but really the main focus at this step is to just find the margins. You don't want to carve anatomy before you have located the boundaries of your restoration. In other words, you want to have the clear outline form of your amalgam in place before you start to create the anatomical features. I've now switched over to the discoid carver, the other end of the instrument, and I'm using this at a right angle to the margin. In other words, perpendicular to the margin, so I don't ditch the margin. I'm resting the instrument partially on tooth structure and partially on the amalgam so that I know when I push I'm not going to take away amalgam and leave a submarginal area. I'm not focusing right now on anatomy. I'm focusing mainly on finding those margins around the periphery. It's 
nice to use a cotton roll that you've torn off the end on so that you can get a nice continuous surface like this. It's a great way to keep a clean palette upon which to do your artwork. What am I doing here? What a strange thing. Well, not really. I'm scooping out the three fossa. The mesial, the central, and distal fossa. And these will serve as waypoints or guides for me as I follow from one area to the other. In other words, I'm going to see that as a low point and then I'm going to see the areas in between as higher points. And that will provide me with a reminder of where I need to have marginal ridges, fossa, triangular ridges, transverse ridges. And now the rest of this is all about just simply creating the anatomy. One of the things that's extremely helpful is to rest the instrument on the tooth while you extend it down in towards the central groove and along the other grooves of the restoration. By utilizing this technique, the tooth itself is giving you what it wants. It's providing you with the anatomical appropriateness, the morphology that matches the contours of the tooth. Not your contours, not your idea of what an amalgam should look like, but the tooth's idea of what an amalgam should look like. And I've always felt it's really important, you know, when it comes to creating functional restorations, aesthetic restorations, that we need to respect nature. We need to appreciate the beauty of teeth and to follow those morphological features. For those of you who are anti-amalgam, I certainly appreciate where you're coming from. I am an educator and I teach amalgams and composites. We are still teaching amalgams in dental schools in the United States and I know this might be appalling for you to see something like this but I think you can at least appreciate the art form of it and appreciate the fact that this can be a teaching tool. Even if a student never places an amalgam in a patient in their entire life, they still gain a significant amount of appreciation for morphology, maintaining proper contours, uh, exacting technique, marginal integrity, proximal contact, how to use the instruments, how to approach the tooth, all of these things can be very, very helpful. You can see here that we're utilizing the cleoid end to enhance the grooves. I've sped up the video a little bit. You know, the entire video really is only about 20 minutes long, and that's about how long it takes to carve a nice amalgam from start to finish uh, because the amalgam is going to set on you anyway. But I've sped up the video so that we get this done in about 13 minutes from start to finish. Once again, wiping off the surface a little bit so that we end up having a little bit more of a smooth canvas upon which to work. And just remember your basic anatomy first. Remember your central groove. Remember your buckle groove and your lingual groove. Remember the fact that the marginal ridge is in a V shape if you viewed it from the mesial. It, it descends downward towards the center from the buckle to the lingual side. Also remember that the marginal ridge has a low point in the contact area it rises up to a crest and then it drops back down into the mesial fossa. We're going to have a similar high, low, high, low transition between fossa and ridges and fossa and ridges as you transverse the tooth from the mesial to the distal or distal to mesial. And the key is to pay attention to that. Uh, don't drag the instrument at the same level from the distal all the way to the mesial. You're going to create a very flat groove that doesn't appreciate the morphological differences from one part of the tooth to the other. I'm now going to use an instrument that is similar to a Brucia 1. Jeff Brucia invented a beautiful instrument for composite restorations that's available from Brassler and also from Stevenson Dental Solutions online store. Uh, but this instrument can be used for amalgams as well. And what I'm doing here is just confirming the groove locations, uh, perhaps doing a little bit of burnishing as I move along the surface of the tooth. So 
sometimes it's helpful to grab an extracted tooth or another Typodon tooth, perhaps the one you're working on that has not been prepared yet, and look at the morphology and try to mimic what you see on the unprepared tooth. Obviously in the mouth you're going to be utilizing the adjacent tooth, the contralateral tooth, to provide you with morphological clues as to how high the marginal ridge should be, uh, how deep the groove should be, how much anatomy is in the tooth, etc. I'm not going to pick up a metal matrix band and just use this as like an IPC and just remove any little flash that may be located at that occlusal part of the embrasure. That works really well. And now I'm just showing again the Brucia 1 compared to a typical acorn burnisher. I find the acorn burnishers to be um, improperly shaped for most amalgams. They may work to burnish and maybe for the condensation part, but when it comes to refining morphology, particularly the groove areas, this little Brucia 1 is phenomenal. So I'm going to do some floss splitting here and the reason why I poke my explorer through a piece of floss is to to bring it into more of a shredded flatter look and then I pull against the premolar away from the tooth we're working on so that I don't lose the contact and then I'm going to really get that gingival area smooth and any excess out of the uh, contact area and then of course pull the floss out without pulling it back through the contact area. You can see the excess amalgam that it picked up on the shredded area that we did this splitting technique for. Anyway, I think that that's basically all I had to share with you today. I am got a large amount of videos that are coming out soon, and I really appreciate you guys watching and for your support.